He's an exalted abd or the best abd, which is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He fulfilled all the requirements of the station of Abu Dhabi. Uh, so, ibadah, when we try to define ibadah, how do we define ibadah? Technically. Yeah. So sometimes you find the scholars, and the same scholars will define ibadah as uh, a comprehensive word uh, of all the actions, statements, as well as abstentions that Allah desires or Allah likes. So any action that you do that Allah likes is a form of ibadah. Any statement that you make that Allah likes is a form of ibadah. And any abstention leaves to abstain from something that Allah dislikes. This abstention will be desired by Allah. This refraining from this thing is desired by Allah. That is also an act of ibadah. But is this the essence of ibadah? This, these, are manifest, these are necessary manifestations of ibadah. But the essence of ibadah is a state of being. It is not a group, a combination of actions and statements and so on. It's a state of being. That state of being, by necessity, will make you abide in your actions, in your statements, and in your abstentions by that which, is, by that which Allah likes. Uh, so, ibadah in essence is tamamul habbi ma tamamul dhulli wal khudur. The essence of ibadah, which is a state of being, not a group of actions, the state of being of the ab, where, where are you called the ab, where you have that state of being, is when you have complete submission and subservience, subjugation, humility complete surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islam, surrender, submission. Islam means peaceful surrender, by the way. But be, don't take the peace out of it, because the, the scene and lamb and meme will give all of those inferences. But Islam does not mean peace per se. It means peaceful surrender peaceful submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the one who submits could submit by force or by will. And Islam means that you submitted willingly, submitted you know, by your own choice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so, so the essence of Islam is about the submission. And it is peaceful submission because it is not submission of out of fear only. It is not submission out of fear only. It is not sub submission to a higher authority only. It's a submission to the highest authority that you love more than anyone else. So the love accompanied by raja, fear and hope, but predominantly the love, made you submit. So this is a willful submission. This is a peaceful submission. You're, you are not dragged into submission. You, and that is why the, your submission will be in your scale of good deeds. That's why it will count before Allah, because you willfully, willingly submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it is this hub mixed with khawf and raja that made you submit. So ibadah is tamam al habbi ma tamam al dhulli wal khudur. It's the mixture of love and adoration with submission and subjugation, humility and subjugation. So dhulli wal khudur is to show humility, surrender, submission, subjugation, subservience, all of these. And al hub is to, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. And to love no one like you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we may talk, inshallah, uh, tomorrow about the stations of love.
So when you when you have those feelings combined for anyone, tamam al hubbi ma tamam al zul al qudur, the ultimate love mixed with ultimate humility and subjugation, that is ibadah. That is ibadah. So if you have such feelings in your heart for anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this shirk. Shirk. Because you could love someone, but you don't surrender to them. And you could surrender to someone, but you don't love them. You surrender to, you know, sometimes you surrender to your enemies. And you submit. And he could even sometimes show humility. That's not ibadah, unless you're also you also love them more than anything else. So if, you, if it is that combination that can only be found in one's, in a moment's heart for one being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, brother. What of the statement that, uh, of loving someone fi sabirillah? You, well, you, you love someone fi sabirillah, ultimately this love is, is relative, not absolute. Allah's love is absolute. And Allah's love is independent of anything else. Your, your love of your brother, if you be Allah, is dependent on your love uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, you allocate all the love to Allah, and then you dispense from it based on people's proximity to or distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the essence of al-wala wal bara The essence of al-wala wal bara is that you take, you remove yourself from the center. You're not at the center anymore. Because uh, keep in mind, egotism, nationalism, racism, tribalism, all of those isms, what do they boil down to? Egotism. Yeah. Because it's all about you. Because racist people do not really revere the race of others. They revere their own race. Tribal, you know, you, you don't have affiliation for other tribes. You have like this zeal for your own tribe. You have zeal for your own clan. And within the clan, you have zeal for your own family. So it is, you know, about circles that are diverging from you, going out from you. Circles, circles, circles. Family, clan, tribe, race. You are at the center. So it, everything is about my tribe, my nation, my people, my race, my. My mind. But when it comes to al wala al bara, when we talk about the ummah and you know allegiance for this ummah, it is completely not about my thing. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is at the center now. And you remove yourself from the center. So not based on people's distance from or proximity to you that you love them, but their distance from or proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is an expression of this, uh, of having given up your right to this love. You say it, it is all Allah's, and then you start to dispense from it based on His desire, not yours. Certainly there are two different types of love, and there is love that is love that you're responsible for, love that you grow, love that you take care of, that you promote. And there is love that is forced upon you. There is love that is, you know, uh, inherent. You love those that are kind to you. This is inherent love. You would love your mother, even if your mother is not the best person in the world, or if he or she has, like, multitudes of problems, or father, or this. Inherently, you love them. The Prophet loved Abu Talib. He was not Muslim. His uncle, is likely about Abu Talib. You do not guide whomever you please, but Allah guides whomever He pleases. So this is love that we find that is that is given to us as a second nature. If we don't have control over this love, are we responsible for this love? No. That is fine. You will by nature love those that are kind to you. You will by nature love those that are closer to you. You're not responsible for this love. The love that you're responsible for is the love that you actually promote, that you actually take care of. Uh, and that is the religious type of love. Al hub al shari, not al hub al jibilli. So,
So then again, ibadah is the combination of the absent, the statements, and the abstentions that Allah likes. These are the manifestations of ibadah. They all reflect a state of being, which is the essence of ibadah, which is tamam al hubb ma tamam al zul al khudur, complete love with mixed with complete complete humility and uh, submission. Yeah, inshallah, I think that the, 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 you know, this is a question about uh, the soul and the, the insolment and so on. So maybe uh, at the end of every session, I will cover the questions, inshallah, so that we don't interrupt the flow of the talk. So ibadah is what we were created for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created the jinn and ins but to worship me. Uh, therefore, it, it you know comes about saying that if you fail to do, uh, if you fail to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, if you fail to reach excellence in the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, then you fail in this life, no matter what you did, no matter what you became, or like well, no matter what career you had, or how much money you collected, you fail at your main function, you fail. And uh, you know, some of the I used to make like very nice uh, parables. And so they would say, for instance, if the pen doesn't write anymore, you could you still use it for some other purpose. You know, you could pick your ear with the pen or something. <laughs> but but that's that is the worth of the pen after it quits writing. Is that the main function of the pen is to write? If it is not writing anymore, then th think of the functions of the pen after it quits writing. Very insignificant. Very insignificant. You become very insignificant. If the refrigerator stops cooling, you can still put the cereal on top of the refrigerator. Yeah? Or you could use the plug. Yeah. But, not, not even a good closet, but but it, that's it. So the human being that is not, you know, worshiping Allah Subhanahu wa Taala as he should, or is not, you know, pursuing excellence in the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, is a human being that lost his main function. Just like the pen that doesn't try it, refrigerator that doesn't cool car that doesn't move. Okay. So the types of ibadah, the types of ibadah, and each one of them we we must you know seek to reach excellence in each one of them. The sayings of the heart, the actions of the heart, the sayings of the body, the actions of the body. The saying of the heart is the testimony of faith. It is a tasdeeq. It is the belief, the faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The testimony of faith before you say it by your tongue, you will say it by your heart. Acknowledgement, recognition and acknowledgement. That is the statement of the heart. The statements, the sayings of the body, the tongue, plenty, you know, beginning from testimony of faith itself, we need to declare uh, verbally. Uh, to all of the others. The actions of the heart, that is about what we will talk about tomorrow and after tomorrow, inshallah. Which is the, 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 you know, it's about humbleness, about humility, about devotion, about watchfulness, about, uh, you know, the removal of the, the bad qualities, fighting. Uh, show it off, ostentation, fighting the arrogance, fighting self-deceit, uh, fighting God, self-conceit. All of these are the actions of the heart. So to have the baseline of faith below which you are not considered a believer, you have to have the baseline of each one of the four mentioned types. The more you have, 
the higher you transcend in the ranks of faith. Certainly there are many uh, indications of the comprehensiveness of ibadah in Islam. Uh, so this hadith from Abi Dhar radiallahu anhu, in which he said, Fi budha yahadikum sadaqa, the Prophet of Salaam said, Fi budha yahadikum sadaqa, Qalwa Rasulullah yati ahaduna shahwata, wa yakunu lahu fihi ajj, faqala raaitum la wala hafil haram, wa kana alayhi fihi wiz, faqalu la qalu naam, kana kathalika, idha wada hafil halal, kana lahu ajj. So it will be counted as a charity, the Prophet of Salaam said, it will be counted as a charity for you when you have intimacy with your wife, he said, O Messenger of Allah, one of us would fulfill his desire and be rewarded. He said, What do you think? Had he fulfilled it through haram, would he have been punished? And he said, Yes. And the Prophet said, Likewise, if he fulfills it in halal, he would be rewarded. So it is Allah's generosity uh, and justice. Uh, this, this is another hadith also. It's reported by Ahmed from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in qamad sa'a, wa biyadi ahadikum fisila, fa in istata'a illa taquma hatta ya risaha fal yafa'a. Which means if the hour comes and one of you has a sprout in his hand, let him, or a seedling in his hand, let him plant it if he can. And this is a very powerful hadith, isn't it? You, you're, you're all aware of this hadith because usually do I repeat it quite often. Uh, but it is, it is a very powerful hadith. And it, it's about hope and determination. It's about sincerity. You know, because you're not going to see it uh, grow. But it doesn't matter. What you do, what's right, what's good, even if you're not going to see it. And for us Muslims, Sometimes it gets to be a, a very frustrating, you know, to uh, basically uh, contemplate our conditions as Muslims. So, like in, in Muslim countries, particularly in Muslim, like back in Muslim countries, you have sometimes people want everything to be quick, to be fast, and they want to see it. You know, if they want to invest, they want to invest today so that they can, you know. Uh, Reclaim their investment yesterday, not tomorrow. Uh, quickly, you know, research, for instance, if you go to universities, or at least I'm talking from my, like, based on my own background, uh, you talk to, you go, go to universities, and people want to finish the study in like a few days because eventually they want to present it, because eventually. You want to earn acclaim and recognition, and you know sometimes monetary uh, benefits from this. It, it, truly, as a Muslim, this should 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 be foreign to us. You know, this attitude should be foreign to us. At least, it should be an attitude that we fight within ourselves, that we try to get rid of. It it, it hurts you when you see that uh, other people, you know commit to like a 25 year long, you know, uh, study and, you know, they may be 60 or 50, 65 or 70 years old when they start to the study. So most likely they will not uh, be there when it gets presented uh, in front, in front, like in a convention or, or something uh, or a meeting. Uh, so they will just start the work and someone else will finish it. Shouldn't we Muslims be like this? Aren't we more deserving of this? Doesn't this hadith say just that and a lot more than that? It is, you know, if the hour comes and you have a seedling in your hand, you know, plant it if you can. So keep on doing good, regardless uh, of, uh, you know, the likelihood of you uh, watching it grow or watching it blossom. This is another hadith from Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu reported by Bukhari and Muslim. Sa'i ala al-armalati wa al-maskeen kan mujahid fi sabeel Allah. The narrator added, wa ahsabuhu qal wa kal qa'im la yaftur wa kal sa'im la yuftur. He who works to provide for the widow and the poor is like a mujahid in the cause of Allah 
and I think he said, the narrative said, I think he said, uh, and that who stands in prayers without boredom, and that who fasts indefinitely. So when we talk about good deeds, good deeds are essential ingredient in the discussion of this game. Your prayers, your fasting, your, your uh, abiding by the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are, es are essential ingredients of your escape, as we will uh, come to know later, inshallah, when we talk about it tomorrow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Have they been have they done what they were exhorted to do? It would have been better for them and would have strengthened their faith. It would have been better for them and would have strengthened their faith. And then this long hadith recorded by Bukhari from Abu Huraira. Uh, if you go to the middle of the hadith, and he continues to draw closer to me with nawafil until I love him. If 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 this kaya, if the ultimate pursuit of this kaya is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here Allah is telling you that he will love you. Not only that you will love him, but imagine he will love you. So it, it, do you need anything more than this? Uh, that, that you become Allah, beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he, Allah says here, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ مُفْتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَمَزَا عَبْدِي يَتْقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ نُعَافِ الْحَتَّى وَحِبْ And my servant does not draw closer to me by anything more beloved to me than that which I have made obligatory on him, which I made farida on him. And he continues to draw closer to me by نُعَافِ until I love him, by sunan and nawafil, option and act, until I love him. And when I love him, I become his hearing with which, he's, with which he hears, and his sight with which he sees, and his hand with which he strikes, and his leg with which he walks, and if he asks me, I will give him, and if he seeks refuge in me, I will protect him, I do not, and I do not hesitate to do anything as I hesitate to take the soul of the believer, for he hates death, and I hate the sad of him. Okay, one more thing that we need to mention also, uh, one more hadith, is that uh, the Prophet made it conditional here. In the, you know, you're, you're, uh, your abiding by the rules of the exterior is conditional for your success in your taskiya. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يستقيم إيمان عبد حتى يستقيم قلبه ولا يستقيم قلبه حتى يستقيم لسانه ولا يدخل رجل من جنة لا يأمن جاره غوبة وإقة The faith of a servant is not put right or is not straightened until his heart is straight. And his heart is not straight until his tongue is straight. And the man whose neighbor does not feel safe from his heart shall not enter paradise. So basically, you cannot claim that your heart is straight unless you have straightened your tongue, unless you have straightened your actions. Because the actions are but the manifestations of what's in the heart. So if the actions are corrupt, then the heart is corrupt. And if the actions are good, then the heart is likely good, but not necessarily good. But corrupt actions indicate corrupt heart, unless someone is forgiven because of ignorance or something of that nature. But corrupt actions indicate a corrupt heart. Good actions, there is another question to be asked. Are they tru truly for Allah? Uh, you know, because you can do lots of good actions for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those will not be an indication of the sound heart. In fact, the, they will be indications of a diseased heart. And to, Ibadah, you know, um, is, is, is not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not. When you, when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's for your own benefit, and Allah does not benefit from this ibadah. 
Muslim reported from Abi Dharm al Afari this beautiful hadith that you are, uh, can see on the screen here. Ya ibadi inni haramtu thumma ala nafsi wa ta'atu bainakum muharraman fala tazalami. In this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this is a divine hadith, a holy hadith. In this hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi inna kumman tablughu dhurri fa tazurruri alam tablughu lafayi fa tarfa'un. Ya ibadi law anna awalakum wa akharakum wa insikum wa jinnakum. كان على أجر قلب رجل واحد منكم ما نقص ذلك في ملك شيء. يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم كان على أتقى قلب رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملك شيء. يا عبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنسكم وجنكم اجتمعوا في صيد واحد فسألوني فأعطيت كل واحد مسألته ما زاد ما نقص ذلك في ملكه إلا كما ينقص ملكي في البحر. So, oh my servants, you will never, you know, the hadith began by I make for I make injustice, I made injustice forbidden upon myself, and I make it forbidden amongst you. But in the middle of the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O oh, my servants, you will never be able to harm me, and you will never be able to benefit me. O oh, my servants, I'm the first of you and the last, and the jinn and the ins from among you uh, were to fear Allah as the best among you, that would not increase in my majesty or mastership in my dominion. My Lordship. And when I increase Allah's uh, uh, dominion, it will not make Allah's Lordship any greater than it is. If we all worship Him like the most pious of us, if we're all as pious as the most pious of us, it will not benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it will not increase His Lordship. So ultimately, it is about our own benefit. Ultimately, it's about our own survival. Why is it important to keep in mind? Why is it important? Because we should not uh, uh, do not consider it a favor upon me that you became Muslims. But it is Allah that considers it a favor upon you that he guided you to faith. If you're true, if you're tr truthful, if you're truthful about your faith, then you should know that it is Allah's favor on you that He guided you to faith. It is not your favor uh, on Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that you. Uh, so sometimes we, we 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 may feel like you know I am doing so much. I you know look at the people around you. And look at where they are. And look how, look at how uh, negligent they are. I go to the masjid more than them. I fast more than most of the people around me. I do this. I do that. And the uh, shaitan will make you, because the, the shaitan will have so many tricks to use. And if he, if you're shown commitment, then the shaitan will make you observe your own. Uh, excellence. And once you have observed your own excellence, you're destroyed. Because all of that is Allah's favor on you, that he guided you, that he empowered you, enabled you to do all of this, that he did not distract you by, by other things. So all of this is Allah's, is, is Allah's favor on you. Is that, that's why our righteous predecessors used to say, كَيْفَ نُشْكُرُهُ حَقَّ شُكْرِهِ وَشُكْرُهُ يَحْتَاجُ إِلَى شُكْرِ How could we thank him enough when thanking him requires more thanking? Because he had it not been for his guidance, he would have not thanked him. So when you thank Allah, you should thank him for having guided you to thanking him. When you show gratefulness, gratitude, then you should say to yourself, you should, you should feel indebted to Allah for having guided you to show him gratitude. The individual ibadat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that these individual ibadat, each one of them works to bring us closer to Allah, works to purify our hearts, works to give us taqwa, such as Siyam, for instance, Ya Ayyuhal Ladeen Amanu Kutiba Alaykum Siyam, Kama Kutiba Alaykum 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 K
fasting was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may attain piety. It's neither their meat nor their blood that reaches Allah, but it is piety from you that reaches Him. So some people show off, even Abu Ayyub al Ansari said, during the time of the Prophet, each one of us used to, each head of the household, used to slaughter one sheep for the entire household. Then it became a matter of showing off. Then it became a matter. So Abu Ibn al is talking to the Tabai. You know, that, that we, the companions of the Prophet, did this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We used to slaughter each, uh, you know, head of the household used to slaughter for the entire household. Uh, but then it became a matter of showing off. So people be, you sort of try to outdo each other in Uthayyah. And then you bring him like a bigger, uh, uh, you know, sheep or something, and you, and, you, and you show off your sheep, you put it in front of your house, or you, you know, in the backyard or something, so that you show it off and someone brings in a cow, you know, to slaughter. Because, you know, and if you truly do this out of, out of the desire to feed the poor, then certainly you're fine. You do more, it's better. You do seven cows, that's great. Seventy cows, that's great. But it is about your intent. Your, 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 what is it that you want from this? Uh, so if you, if you buy a cow because, you know, my brother also bought a cow, and my cousin bought a cow, and how would they sacrifice a sheep when everybody else is sacrificing, sacrificing cows? Then it loses its meaning. Because ultimately, it is not the blood or the flesh that will reach Allah. It is the piety of your hearts. So when the piety is gone, because it, it lost its meaning, it became for show and off, then it is, it is money that you're losing. It's money that you, you're losing. Take uh, donations or alms or charity from their wealth in order to purify them and sanctify them with it and invoke Allah for them. Very your invocations are a source of tranquility for them. Okay, so we'll stop here and take this question, inshallah, and then take a break. Uh, so there is a question here, can you please explain the soul coming to the womb? Is there an agreement among the scholars? If the person who wrote the question doesn't mind asking, you know, clarifying what they want particularly, which, what is it that they, they want to ask about? Because there is a lot to say about the soul coming to the womb. It's about the days, is it 40, you said the first 40 or the third 40 days? Yeah, so the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud indicates, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in some of its narrations, in hadakum yajma'u khalquhu fi batni ummi arba'ina yawman aw arba'ina layla, nutfa thumma yakun mu'alaqatan, مثل ذلك ثم يكون مضغة مثل ذلك ثم يرسل إليه الملك فيرفق فيه الروح. so so far the 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 creation of one of you or the the gathering of one of you takes place in the womb of his mother for forty days in the form of a drop and then for forty days in the form of a clot. Uh, or a leech-like clot, and then for 40 days in the form of a chewed piece of uh, flesh. And then the angel will be sent to him and commanded to uh, breathe uh, the soul into him. Uh, so this, from this hadith, from this narration, the scholars felt that you are not for 40 days, most of the scholars felt you are not for 40 days, then you are alaqa for 40 days, then you are mudla for 40 days, 
and that is 120 days, and then the angel will be sent to breathe the soul into you. To breathe the soul into you. That is the position of the majority of scholars. However, for, you know, even some of our earlier scholars, such as Ibn Zamlakani uh, and, and others, they, they contested this position because in some other hadith, uh, it actually says uh, that the malak will be sent after 42 days. At least that's reported uh, in Muslim from Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. It says that the malak will be sent after 42 days. And also, this very hadith of Abdullah ibn Saud has other narrations, other narrations, in which there is a slight variation in the wording. So the narration that was reported by Muslim of this hadith of Abdullah ibn Saud, the Prophet said, then he will be alaqa or a leech like plot in that for an equal period. In that is what? Is it in the womb or in the 40 days? So the Prophet said, It says here, is brought together in his mother's belly or womb for 40 days. Which one is mentioned last, the 40 days or the mother's womb? The 40 days mentioned last. In the form of a drop, then he is a clot of blood for a like period. In some other report, then he is a clot in this for a like period in this. What is this? The 40 days or the belly? So the scholars who, uh, you know, who say that it is all in the first 40 days, they say no. This the word this here refers back to the 40 days because that's the last thing that was mentioned. So in this, so the alaqa in the 40 days, the first 40 days and the mudra in the first 40 days. And medically speaking, it, it, it is all in the first 40 days. If we can, if we, if we, because the araka, the mudra, and so on, the embryogenesis is complete by 58 days, and then you grow. But all of your organs have been already formed by 58 days. Uh, and then we have the hadith of Hazaifa, the other hadith of Hazaifa, which talks about 42 days. Uh, and we have the report of this, the Muslim report of this hadith, which says in this, which means in the first 40 days. So that position is stronger. Now, then we come to the second uh, dilemma here. If we say all of this happens in the first 40 days, and then the angel will be sent, does that mean that the malak will be sent will be sent to, to breathe the soul into the body after the first 40 days? The word thumma does not mean immediacy. It means then, thereafter. Thereafter, not immediately thereafter. It has been fa, fa ilayhi al then it would have meant immediately thereafter. Thumma, it means thereafter. Which means what? After some time. Now we have in the Quran, like in the beginning of Surah Al Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَخَلَقْنَا الْمُرْضَفَ عِظَامًا فَكَسَاوْنَا الْعِظَامَنَا الْرَحْمَةً ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَاهُ خَلْقًا آخَرًا فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ We have made the mudra into bones, and then we have 
uh, encased the bones with flesh. And then we made him a different creation. Then we made of him a different creation. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu said, then we made of him a different creation, means we breathed the soul into him. What does that mean? It means that the nafq of a ruh, which is insolment of the breathing of the soul, does not happen immediately after the stage of mudba. Because Allah mentioned two different stages after the mudba, which is the true piece of flesh. We made the mudba into bones. That's a stage after the mudra. And then, and we wrapped or encased or clothed the azam with flesh, the bones with flesh. So that means what? It means there is like a latency between the, the stage of mudra and the breathing of the soul. The scholars have reported consensus that the breathing of the soul, some of the verifying scholars reported consensus that the breathing of the soul happens at 120 days. So we will go by this consensus, even though we will consider the, the formation of the, the stages of formation uh, you know, to happen in the first 40 days. Because we believe there is a period between the formation and the insolvent, which is when the, 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 it will become bones and the bones will be wrapped by flesh and so on. So that is, that's as far as I believe in concerning this issue. How does Allah become one's hearing, seeing, walking, etc.? So your, your hearing and seeing will be in accordance with the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be, there is, the union of purpose is different from the union of essence. Your togetherness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mean union in essence. Because union in essence is a deviant uh, theology where there is no distinction between the creation and the creator. But there is union of purpose. When your purpose is completely according to his, completely subservient to his, you cannot separate between your purpose and his. And if Jesus actually said, God and I are one, which is, you know, in the in the current versions of the uh, New Testament. If he actually said this, then we would say that he meant we're one in purpose. Like my purpose is exactly like Allah's God's purpose, that we are one in purpose. Like I don't deviate from his uh, his will. My will is in complete conformity with his, that it is completely united in, in that sense. So that is the union of purpose. And then all of your actions, your hearing, your seeing, will be uh, in complete conformity, accordance with the divine will, and that will be certainly yeah, the, the highest station. Thus the hadith, the faith of a servant is not put right until his heart is put right. Does this hadith to the argument of those Sufi sects who claim that the love of Allah needs to The 
Buddha Allah needs to in person part before he worries about the actions. Don't they always uh, enforce the love, not the action? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well, let's just uh, so that we don't. Let's be very clear that. Uh, not everyone who's called Sufi invites the, those innovations. It is extremely clear, despite the fact that the Sufi path has been polluted by a lot of corruption uh, caused by the deviant practitioners of Sufism, and that became so prevalent in our modern times amongst them the Sufi path, in and of itself, does not mean deviation. And not every Sufi practitioner or so, so, you know, seeker of this path has been deviant or is deviant. And this is important to, to know. Uh, Ibn Tamir, rahimahullah, he talked a lot about Sufism, right? He crit critiqued Sufism so much. But he divided Sufism, after all, to Sufism that is straight and Sufism that is deviant. Sufism that is in accordance, in conformity with you know, the, the Sunnah of the Prophet like the Sufi of the Junaid and Harith al Muhasabi and those people, and Sufism that is deviant, like that of Al Hamad and Ibn Arabi and so on. So there, this is extremely important to keep in mind. Now, that the path has been polluted by a law of deviation does not mean that everybody who walked down that path is corrupt or is also polluted. Uh, but for those of them, for those of them, you know, the, that's, what, that's why we, uh, like I prefer, and, and we should all prefer to use words like the scale, for instance. Because the word the Sawuf itself is a word that was not used by the Prophet and his companions. It's a terminology that became, you know, so vague. Like because of the practitioners, many of the seekers of this path have damaged the term itself. And it is better that we just stick to this gear. Because that is what Allah SWT used in the Quran. Uh, to purify them and teach them the book in wisdom, or to teach them the book of wisdom and to purify them. So I prefer to use the word tiskiyah. However, the word tasawuf in itself does not mean deviate. deviation, is not synonymous with deviation. The word tasawuf is not synonymous with deviation. Some of the uh, deviant sects amongst this path, they uh, certainly emphasize the work for the actions of the heart at the expense of the actions of the body. They created a dichotomy or a conflict that does not exist because the Prophet and his companions never, never uh, failed on either side you know, of this equation the body or the heart. They never quit working, you know, ex in the work of the exterior because they, they reached the highest station of the interior. And they were most deserving of those highest of stations. Abu Bakr, Omar, you know, later on the Prophet Sallallahu but Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman and Ali, we have always known that they were committed with their prayers, their fasting, their abiding by the law and the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, internally and externally until the end of their lives. So yes, this hadith amongst, you know, the, the, the lives of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu is your greatest argument in this regard. Because they never failed at, you know, their commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the commitment of the exterior as well as that of the interior, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. So whoever, uh, whenever anyone puts, to, tries to put down uh, or downplay the importance of the pillars of Islam, after all, is uh, salah, siyam, hajj, you know, zakat. These are acts of the exterior, not acts of the interior. So anyone who tries to put down or underplay, downplay the pillars of Islam, then they must be deviant, and the life of the Prophet and his companions is your best argument against them. Let's take a break for 10 minutes and then come back to you.